Hey guys, welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Ashley Mova, and this is The Daily Show. We give you all the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Leading off the show today is John Campia. Well, greetings and salutations, everybody. Welcome to the best damn movie-related show on the planet Earth, coming to you from right here at the Collider Video Studios here in Burbank, California, and we are so glad you decided to make us part of your day. Also here, John Schnepp. So excited. It's a big news day. A lot of stuff coming down at you. I cannot wait to break some of this insane, <laughs> fantastical news. I'm, I'm, I'm bur bursting about talking about it. You've been giddy all day. Yeah, really Just giddy. giddy. What, what was the word that you used for it earlier? Uh, uh, humbly goop? Yeah, I think it was a humbly goop. No, Google. no, it wasn't gobbly goop. It was, it was Google gobble. Hoobble goobly goobles. Uh, Google whatever. Gobble. Yeah, Mark Ellis is here. Yep. Oh yeah, hey, I'm also here and joining me today is very special guest on the roof right now, Santa Claus, practicing his reps, getting in shape for December 25th. You might hear some thumping around on the show today. We got guys doing roof hard work on the roof. He's uh, panicking because he studio. can't find so the might... chimney. So he's like, he keeps running back and forth because he can't find the chimney. He's looking it's for it. It's he's like, he's running gassers. He's doing some cone drills. You have to deliver the presents. You have to eat the cookies. You have to get on. There's a lot of things. There's a lot of technical things that you kids don't realize about Santa's job. Yeah. Because for some reason now in North America, we start putting up Christmas decorations in October. <laughs> Before Halloween. Before Halloween. I don't, I it's really don't wrong. Get it. It's All right. Wrong. What's up today, Ashley? When news first hit that Deadpool director Tim Miller would be exiting the sequel over creative differences, the internet was abuzz with names on who should direct the movie, taking into account the fact that they will have to also gel with producer and star Ryan Reynolds. And though an enterprising fan created a change.org petition asking Quentin Tarantino to step into the deserted slot, it got us thinking who should direct Deadpool 2. We asked the panel to come up with their two choices to take over Deadpool 2. John, what two directors would would you choose to take over Deadpool? Yeah, I'm still kind of bummed over the idea that Tim Miller, like that, that, I mean, I agree with him leaving. If they had different visions and different ideas about what the movie could be and all that kind of stuff. And, and if Tim Miller wanted Kyle Chandler as Cable, I'm, it was then it was the right move for him to move on to do something that'll make him happy and it's the right move for Deadpool 2 to get a director in who's going to stay in step with the spirit of the first film I think that's really important so I was trying to think about this and I got to thinking who would be my two guys well let me throw out one name I did mention on the show yesterday but I want to make a case for him and that is Guy Ritchie uh, like when you look at Lock, Stock and Two Smoking Barrels Snatch his Sherlock Holmes stuff um, you know Rock and Rolla but you know what, when he came out with The Man From U.N.C.L.E., I think that showed us a, another side to what he can do. He can tell through affair stories. He can tell those things in the midst of this chaotic, weird, often irreverent kind of humor, and he does some great action as well. So, I, I mean, I don't know what I think about this new Camelot movie he's doing. I think that looks a lot more like Deadpool in, in medieval times than I expected. It, it's Deadpool with, in medieval times. Go. That's going to be on the poster for the movie. <laughs> um, so I, you know, I think he'd be a terrific choice. I'm all for that. But actually, my number one choice, and it's not just because he's a name. I think if you really think about it, what he's done in his movies, I think it would lend well to Deadpool. Edgar Wright. I think Edgar Wright. When you look at, first of all, we know he can bring the funny. But when you under, when you look at films like Hot Fuzz and stuff like that as well, you see that he's got a great sense of the irreverent as well. Because a lot of the style of humor in Hot Fuzz is, while not in the same structure, it's the same kind of genreic style, you know, of humor that he, they use in Deadpool. I think he'd be terrific for it. I love Scott Pilgrim vs. the World. I've always wanted to see what he would have done with Ant Man, but those are my two picks, Guy Ritchie. But my number one pick is actually Edgar Wright. What about you, Schnepp? Or no, who's next? Uh, I, I will go next. You go next. You want. I love the Edgar Wright pick, <laughs> particularly with, with the world's end, because you showed he can do action and comedy. Right. And that's what I was looking for in my directors, is can you mix it up a little bit? The first one is going to be Adam McKay, where we haven't seen a whole lot of action from him on the surface, but then you start to think, you know what, he did a great job helping with the story of Ant-Man, and he's also working on the story for Ant-Man and the Wasp. Plus, look at those fight scenes in Anchorman and Anchorman 2, The Legend Continues. <laughs> that's some good action going on here with a comic element, of course, with a big short he showed he could tell a story. So I think Adam McKay is a great selection to be directing Deadpool 2. And then I'm also going to go with Antoine Fuqua. I mean, maybe I'm still high from seeing The Magnificent Seven and how much fun that was, but that movie had one of the best action set pieces I've seen in recent years, and it had a lot of humor to it as well. He can go more serious with something like Training Day, of course, and get two great performances, but Olympus Has Fallen is another one that has some comedy elements and is a little over the top. And he also directed Bait. Way back in his IMDb, he directed Bait, which is a funny action comedy as well. So those are my two picks, Schnepp. 
Who are you bringing to the table against me? All right. Number one, I'm bringing Santa Claus. And number two, I'm bringing Tommy <laughs> Wiseau from the room. Now, my real list. You know, I, I was going to say uh, all of us probably would give uh, Matthew Vaughn an honorable mention. Oh, I've jumped oh, on that. Yeah, yeah. I'll mention so, yeah. But no, Matthew Vaughn, I think we'd all agree, yeah. would be a terrific choice. Yeah, so he got, he got eliminated film. from the list, and then Harloff decided not to join us today. Thanks, <laughs> Christian. Anyway, so Matthew Vaughn would have been on the list. But you know what? Uh, my, my two, I'm going to go with uh, my top choice would be Kevin Smith. Why? Um, not only did he start out with Clerks, and every single one of his movies has had comic book humor, uh, you know, R-rated humor, funny humor, but he's, yeah, he understands he, that he understands comic books more than anyone else that I could think of. Because not only has he had comic books in all of his movie references, but he's written comic books. He's written Green Arrow. Now he's he's moved into another phase of his life where he's doing these really cool creative horror films and directing a lot of superhero TV shows like The Flash, like Supergirl. So he'd be my top choice because he's really shown that he can integrate really funny stuff with super heroics and let the you know the creative team like the thing the the hole that's going to be left because tim miller left a lot of people aren't thinking about this but tim miller rose to fame because of his animation studio blur studios right now blur studios did a lot of freebies on deadpool i mean the budget was tiny and that studio the special effects studio took the small budget and plussed it so that it looked like a hundred mm -hmm. 150 million dollar film they don't get that for free this time because Tim Miller left, and with him, Blur Studios left. So big mistake. So you're gonna you need to fill that in with someone not only who's super talented but can, knows how to work with the crew. So uh, my second uh, is Sam Raimi. So you know we have Kevin Smith on one side, we have Sam Raimi who's done a ton of big budget films, namely Spider Man and Spider Man Two. We'll give him a break with Spider Man Three. <laughs> He's also another trilogy that he did an incredible job with: Evil Dead, Evil Dead Two, and then Army of Darkness. So that trilogy. So Sam Raimi's really familiar with mixing horror and comedy. I think he would do, and also doing superhero films. So I think he would do a great job. I, I like that yeah, Raimi like that. pick a lot. Yeah. Now you, we got some dark horses here. I do have a dark horse. Yeah, and I might get laughed out of the room. And if you want me to get off the desk, Tommy I, can, I don't have to. It is not Tommy was so. Oh. It is actually a young man named Ben Stiller. I think Ben Stiller could get because he got a really out of the room he got that. a really dark comedic tone and got it to a T way back in 1995 with a cable, cable guy. guy. Yeah. And then he also did Tropic Thunder, which had a lot of yes, action. In it. I love you Tropic want somebody Thunder. that can pull off action set pieces, even if they were used primarily for comedic effect in prior movies. You need somebody with that kind of reps under their belt. Ben Stiller has proven that he can do comedy. Maybe not so much being the leading man anymore as we saw with Zoolander too. But if he's stepping back and he's behind the camera, that's his sole focus. I think Ben Stiller is a nice dark horse option. I like that dark horse cable guy and uh, Tropic Thunder are mm -hmm. great. I'm still I'm sticking with Kevin Smith. Now one of the keys for whoever the new director is going to be is they got to be able to gel with the very strong vision that the producer of this movie has and that producer just happens to be Ryan Reynolds. Totally. I think a lot of the picks that we all came up that were probably all people that would work pretty well with Ryan Reynolds. Mm -hmm. um, you know we mentioned that there was a petition started online for um, I was going to say Oliver Stone. It wasn't Oliver Stone. Quentin Tarantino. Quentin Tarantino. Uh, to direct it, and we all thought it was a bad idea. Actually, you weren't here yesterday. Yeah, we but I thought, agree, it's a bad idea. Yeah, it's it's a it's a bad <laughs> idea. Not because Quentin isn't a magnificent director. Of course he is. It's number one. It's a movie he would never want to never. Do. Mm -hmm. uh, number two, he would not be able to function with Ryan Reynolds. I don't think because Quentin Tarantino does Quentin Tarantino right. films. Um, and as of right now, actually, the writing of the show notes, the signatures were only about three thousand for that one anyway. But a lot of people have been mentioning to me on Twitter. They said, why doesn't Ryan Reynolds just direct it himself? Uh, I mean, he's got a vision for it and all that kind of stuff. My one big hesitation on that is simply this. Do not underestimate how hard of a job directing is and the skill set you need to have to actually be a director. Ryan Reynolds isn't a director. I mean, that doesn't mean he can't become one or be one down the road if he wanted to, but it's such a different skill set. Just because you got an idea about what you want a movie to be doesn't mean you have the skills and the talents to actually get behind the camera and direct it. But Schnepp, you've been faking it for years. How do yeah. you pull it off? <laughs> well, usually I hire a doppelganger or multiple <laughs> other directors and just take all the credit. Um, um, it's really hard. It is, it's, you know, it's an entire other job. So hats off to all the people who have, or the multi-hyphenates, writer, actor, director, yeah. editor, you know, all that stuff. Because every single one is its own separate job. So. 
I really, even if Ryan Reynolds wants to direct, I would love for him to not direct Deadpool as his first film. As his first film, yeah. like, one to learn yeah, on. Do the what job. Chris yeah. Evans did. Do a little shit, you know, movie on the train. Or where you Ben Affleck time. when he did Gone Baby Gone, exactly. as a smaller piece. Yeah. Get his teeth cut. So that's how you kind of like you should start getting on that train with a smaller thing that maybe you're not in, so you could focus on the the craft of directing. You know, making sure your scenes all work together. The the actors are in the right mental state. It's all those kinds of things are like a really a big part of the act of the director's job and also integrating with the DP, working with the editor, working with, you know, the pre-production, the, the actual shoot and the post-production. You as a director carry it from the very beginning all the way to the end. Now as a producer, which Ryan Reynolds also is, he also was there from the very beginning, shepherding it with Miller all the way to getting that trailer drop, to getting the, the promotion for Deadpool, not giving up on that character because he was attached as a producer. So I think, you know, him being a producer on Deadpool 2 is a very smart and important part of that chain, but he has to get a director that can see the vision the way Miller and him work together. It's really unfortunate that that happened, but I mean, Tarantino's not the right call. I don't I, I don't even know why people are signing a petition like that. Tarantino, it's not only that he said he doesn't want to do superhero films, he's an independent. He's writing his own films. He's going to make yeah. his own films. He's only going to make maybe like two more or three more if we're lucky. So I would like, you know, let him do his thing. There's a lot of other directors out there who would be like, gladly direct Deadpool too. All right, what's next? According to a report from THR, Sony is lining up screenings, mailers, ads, and more as part of a new campaign to land Seth Rogen and Evan Goldberg's R-rated spoof of animated movie Sausage Party Academy Award recognition. The film will be submitted for Oscars consideration in the animated feature category, with Tom Rothman, Sony Pictures chief, telling the trade, Academy members are way smarter and more forward-thinking than people realize. They want to recognize bold, original, risky breakthroughs and that's what Sausage Party is, however subversive. Plus, it's just plain cool. Mark, do you think Sausage Party has a chance for Oscar consideration? Ashley, I think it does have an outside shot of being nominated for Best Animated Feature, but it does have a tall mountain to climb because I think you have three sure things that will definitely be nominated for Best Animated Feature. I think that's going to be Zootopia, Finding Dory, and Kubo and the Two Strings. And then you have what could be Moana. Now, we haven't seen Moana yet. It comes out later in November, but I think that has all the makings of something that the Academy would love to at least nominate for Best Animated Picture. So at that point, you have one slot left. And I don't hate that going to Sausage Party because I thought The Secret Life of Pets, it made a crap ton of money. I didn't like the movie as much as Sausage Party. I didn't think it was all that, even though it was a great premise, it didn't feel that original to me. It felt like something I've seen a hundred times. Sausage Party was a new thing. So you're saying Sausage Party is gonna fill that slot? Oh boy, oh, oh boy, Ashley. <laughs> That's what he said. <laughs> no. I think it's got I think it's got a decent chance. Um, you know, in years past I believe there were years where the animated best animated uh, feature only got 3 nominations. And then at some point it changed over to five, I believe. I know last year they definitely had five nominations. First of all, I don't think Best Animated Feature should have five nominations. There's just not enough films mm. to fill. You know, when you're talking about Best Director, okay, there's a thousand films you could pick from this year. Best feature length animated film, there's not a hundred of them out there, you know? So I, I do think this is one of those categories that, because I love animated film, but just from the representation size, I think it should probably be a three nominee uh, category. If this was a three year, uh, one of those years where they only had three nominees for Best Animated, no chance in hell that Sausage Party, because you, you mentioned it. You got Finding Dory's mm -hmm. gonna get nominated, uh, you got Zootopia's gonna get nominated, and you got Kubo and the Two Strings. Kubo and the Two Strings probably weren't winning it. But I think you're right. This year, now personally, I did like Secret Life of Pets a lot more than I like Sausage Party. So personally, I would give the, that four spot to Secret Life of Pets. But then you got a lot of weak films. You got Angry Birds. You got uh, Trolls is an unknown at this point because only one of us in this in this uh, building has seen Trolls yet. So that's an unknown. Storks, I don't think is going to get the spot, even though I kind of I enjoyed Storks. Uh, I don't think the latest Ice Age movie is going to do it. Moana is a Disney film, so maybe that's the five spot. There's a chance. But all those these things that the Sony chief said about about being subversive and edgy, no, it wasn't. I mean, I like nobody likes crude R-rated humor more than me. That's why I love Deadpool so much. That's why I love a lot of the movies that I love. But just having your character look at the camera and yell F F F F F F to me isn't funny. Uh, aside from the final five minutes, which which just 
nearly made me physically sick. I was laughing so hard at that <laughs> movie. I mean, I walked out grinning a sausage party <laughs> just because of the last five minutes of it. But overall, I thought it was a failure of a film. I, mm. I didn't enjoy it. So I wouldn't give it the spot, but in a year of five nominees, and like you said, a lot of people think more of Secret Life of Pets the way you do. I liked it more than most people. So you got to figure Moana's there. There could be that fifth spot that is up for grabs, and Sausage Party could be the one that grabs it. Well, I mean, whether they even get the spot or not, I like that they're soliciting to be an Oscar right, yeah. nominee because they're bringing, once again, more awareness to R-rated animation. Yeah. And they're and standing adult, behind it. Yeah, and, and adult animation and saying, saying, hey, you know, you should at least acknowledge it. So even if it doesn't get acknowledged, as an Oscar nominated uh, film, I think what they're doing is they're bringing they're bringing back awareness like, oh, yeah, that's right. That was a hard R anim animated film and get ready for more of it. So. Well, you were talking about how, how stacked the best director, best actor category can be every year because there's so many movies that come out. How about best original song or best original music, which is what yeah. South Park Big Long and Uncut was nominated for that's right. way back in 1990. Do you think that was opening Blame Canada? Tune, was that the song that was Blame Canada? Yeah. That's right. Yeah, which is a good mantra for all you kids at home. Um, <laughs> I would also say that, like, look, there's a great opening number in Sausage Party, so maybe we do see the there Academy is a in some really way. Good, actually. You know what? That 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 opening number is really good. Mm -hmm. I was actually completely on board with the film for the first five minutes, and that song yeah. was one of the reasons why. All right, guys. Well, it is Tuesday, which means it's time for us to talk about what is opening this week. Brought to you by our good friends at AMC Theaters. Ashley, what is opening this week? Inferno. Famous symbologist Robert Langdon, Tom Hanks, follows a trail of clues tied to Dante, the great medieval poet. When Langdon wakes up in an Italian hospital with amnesia, he teams up with Sienna Brooks, Felicity Jones, a doctor he hopes will help him recover his memories. Together, they race across Europe and against the clock to stop a madman, Ben Foster, from unleashing a virus that could wipe out half of the world's population. You know, I got to say, I'm excited to see this because, number one, I love Tom Hanks. Number two, I love Ron Howard. And number three, because I have not been a big fan of the first two films of this franchise. And for whatever reason, a trailer is just a trailer, but this movie feels different to me. And now I'm, we're actually gonna see it later today. Yes, we we're are. gonna go and watch Inferno later today. So we have not seen it yet. And I gotta say, the, the, the direction they seem to be going, the tone they seem to be embracing for this one, feels better to me than the previous two, and I'm really anxious to see what I would consider to be a great movie with Ron Howard and Tom Hanks together. It seems like it should be a no-brainer, so I'm looking forward to this. Yeah, I, I do like watching these movies for what they are. They're, they're a fun ride, and it's kind of like fake smart. A lot like me. You know, like, like I went to college, I got a communications degree, I, I'm aware of Dante's Inferno, so I can watch the movie and they're making inferences, and I'm like, oh yeah, that does make sense, that is the way you would do it. A lot like you would do with one of those fun national treasure movies. Now, if you actually study Dante's Inferno, or you actually are like a real educated person, you might look at some of this and be like, well, okay, that's not really how it syncs up. But you're right. The trailer did enough to hook me, and I'm excited to go there tonight and get a big bag of popcorn and just stuff my face and watch Tom Hanks and Felicity Jones, one of yep. her three movies that she's got coming out this fall. This one, I don't think it's going to be the best of her three movies, because I've already <laughs> seen one of them, and I'm really excited about the other one, but I, I'm kind of pumped for Inferno. I got to be honest, I'm not. I, I didn't even see the other two because these are those Tom Hanks movies that made me not want to see any more Tom Hanks movies because I didn't go see those. Right. It just felt like, oh, why is he doing this? Is it kind of like an action hero? It wasn't Paul Bettany, like the monk that like yeah, beat himself, like one the of them, creepy yeah. albino or something. I don't know. It, these films never did anything for me, so I'll wait and see. If you guys say Inferno is really great, maybe I'll check it out. But like Tom Hanks, I love him in Sully. He's such a great actor. Oh, so but then good. occasionally he does these kinds of movies, and these are the films where I'm like, I always take a pass on it. But here's the thing: if you're a symbologist, and this is you, like your third adventure running around the globe, and you're trying to solve something it just in the nick of time, stop wearing a suit. I really don't. <laughs> get it. I get it for Bond because he's going to a lot of like high society sure. kind of events. Do ask more like Indiana Jones, man. It's your third rodeo. Look the part. Hanks. You know, I got to say about Tom Hanks, um, Tom Hanks is like, Anne gets to go to a lot of things with me because and she likes him. She has fun. Tom Hanks, though, to Anne is life and water and air. <laughs> she like, no, first of all, big is her all time by 
far. Yep. Big is her favorite movie of all time. If I walk into a room and I start to talk to her, but either where there's a commercial or an interview or a movie with Tom Hanks is on TV, I'll come in, hey baby, shut up! You know, <laughs> it's, it's instantly what she'll, like Tom Hanks is everything to her. The, the one thing that would make her feel like marrying me was actually worth it is if someday I can introduce her to Tom Hanks. That would like just be it for her. So you know she's excited to see this movie too. All right, guys, listen, we have a new uh, short video series on Collider Video that we call Crash Course, where we take a topic and get you caught up to speed on what that topic is in just a couple of minutes. We recently did a new Crash Course video on who is Deathstroke, because recently they announced that Deathstroke was going to be the villain in the upcoming Batman movie. So we did our recent Crash Course on who is Deathstroke. Check it out. Deathstroke. Who is the new Batman villain? It's been announced that the villain in the upcoming Batman movie is going to be Deathstroke, but who is Deathstroke? Basically, he's a mercenary, a father, a supervillain, and an all-around badass within the universe of DC Comics. But let's take a moment to dig a little deeper and get to know the man behind the black and orange mask, Slade Joseph Wilson. He was originally created by comic book legends Marv Wolfman and George Perez as a part of their run on the now classic comic series New Teen Titans in 1980. Wilson started off as a member of the U.S. Army, but eventually was chosen to participate in an experiment that granted him superhuman abilities, just like Captain America, Winter Soldier, Wolverine, Abomination, uh, you get the point. Slade fell in love with the woman who trained him in the military, and the son they had together, Joseph, was kidnapped, had his throat cut, and nearly died because of Slade's work as a gun for hire. His wife wasn't too thrilled about it, so she shot Deathstroke through the eye, permanently disabling him. Needless to say, the two are no longer together, giving new definition to the term irreconcilable differences. Slade's older son, Grant Wilson, decided to follow in the family footsteps and become a supervillain calling himself Ravager. He wound up dying in a fight with the Teen Titans and, as one might expect, Deathstroke was pissed and vowed revenge. But cue son number one. Turns out Joseph Wilson scored some superpowers of his own, and they helped heal his throat and helped him stop dear old dad while working with the Titans. From this storyline on, Deathstroke walked the fine line between supervillain and antihero, like Adam Sandler going to wherever the biggest paycheck led him. <laughs> Shut up! Proficient in more martial arts styles than you can count, Slade's abilities allow him to access 90% of his brain. He's somewhat comparable to Captain America in that he's a super soldier in top physical form, and Wilson is also a master at nearly every weapon he gets his hands on, from guns to swords, and he carries around a staff with the ability to fire off energy blasts at his targets. How badass is this guy? He beat Batman in a fist fight. And that's not all. In addition to fighting prowess and mental capability, Slade Wilson also possesses a healing factor that may not have been enough to save his lost eye, but it does allow him to take a whole bunch of hits that would undoubtedly kill any regular Joe. Deathstroke has also appeared on television as the main antagonist in the CW's Arrow, and on the animation front in the Cartoon Network's Teen Titans. Titans, go! So clearly Deathstroke has been a significant figure within the DC comic realm, Incorporating this mercenary into the DC Extended Universe on the big screen seems like a slam dunk, so it'll be exciting to see what Joe Manganiello does in the role. Maybe not that. All right, you can catch more Crash Course videos on the main page of our YouTube Collider video page. There's a playlist there called Crash Course. We've got stuff there on Mace Windu and Snoke. We've got uh, Mr. Sinister. We've got stuff on the Power Rangers. Go and check out those videos. I think you'll enjoy them. All right, guys, it's time of the show for Buy or Sell. Here's how this works. In front of her, ass, she's got a few other items in the world of movie news. She's going to run them down, and those of us at the table are simply going to say whether we buy it or sell it. So Ashley, what do we got? Ever since the debut of The Force Awakens, fans have been wondering who Rey's parents are and when their identity will be revealed. While Daisy Ridley isn't saying much, she did say when we'll be able to find out. Speaking with Vulture, Ridley addressed the theories out there saying, we will see in a year, just sit tight on that question. Schnett by herself fans finding out who Rey's parents are in episode eight. Yeah, I buy it. We've we've known it ever since they introduced her in The Force Awakens. She's a Skywalker. There's not. She is a Skywalker. <laughs> she is Stop not a Skywalker. I will no bet John chance Campia in hell. A hundred dollars, guys, guys, right guys, now. guys. She's Snoke. Yes, <laughs> Mark. This, this, to me, it's like the, the it, she's a Skywalker. She's cousins with Kylo Ren. We already know Kylo Ren 
is uh, Princess Leia is his mom. So come mm -hmm. on. The whole Star Wars, all six movies, you have to be a Skywalker in order to get into the movie in the first place. To be one of the main characters, you got to be a Skywalker. Rey is a Skywalker. Case closed. I tend to think she's a Skywalker as well still, but I'm very, very iffy on it. However, these comments, I don't think this is Daisy Ridley confirming that we're going to find out who her parents are. I sell that that's her confirming it. I, what I buy is that she's saying, go see the movie in a year, and then we'll talk, and we can infer more things. However, I do believe we will get the reveal of who her parents are in episode eight. I just don't think they're going to save that nugget until nine. And if you remember this classic Star Wars trilogy, we found out who Luke's daddy was. It was at the end of the second one, but we did find out who that was. Mm. As far as who it actually is, John, that's a, we're going to debate this. I'm going to go back and forth forever, but I am excited to see these comments. However, I don't think it's her confirming it. No, I don't think she, that's necessarily her confirming. As a matter of fact, I think there's a pretty decent chance that we don't find out until episode nine. Oh, it's going to be tough. I, I, it would be tough, but I think there's a pretty decent chance. But I think ultimately everybody's going to be disappointed, not in the movies, because the movies are going to be awesome as they have been awesome already. I think a lot of people are thinking, if somebody's in the movie and they're important, they've got to have a marquee parentage. No, they don't. They simply don't. She's not a Skywalker. There's no way she's a Skywalker. I think all the stuff in the movie points to the fact that she's not a Skywalker. John Campy, I'm betting you $100 Christian, right now. Even Christian $100. Harloff. Shake my hand. Bucks. I'm watching this. It, it went through. It went through. They even Christian Harloff, who was stone cold mm -hmm. that she's a Skywalker, He's flipped on that really? now. Even he I'm now doesn't Christian believe. I'm Harloff. I'm making 200 bucks today, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. I just made $200. Uh, I don't think, but in, in, in actuality, like, I don't think this is her saying we're going to find out a year. She was very vague. And then she goes, let's just wait a year. I actually think we're going to find out in episode nine. Not that it matters. It, but it, the, uh, are you kidding? It's, it, is this, it, it's it, a big it deal? Great is it important? Yes, it's going to be very, very weird walking out of that theater and still not knowing because that's the first thought we're going to have. The movie could blow yeah. our minds. And we're like, that's the greatest movie ever. The first thing we're going to say is, ah, I guess we got to wait two more years no. to find out who we raised parents We will find out. Okay, well, I, I want to throw it over to the other table here for a second. So, Wendy, let me start with you. Two questions. Okay. Number one. Do you think Ray is a Skywalker? And number two, do you think we're going to find out who her parents are in episode eight or episode nine? In my heart, yes, I want her to be a Skywalker. <laughs> I still think, and I know everybody is against this already, but I still think that Luke is somehow related to her. Maybe not directly her father, but, um, and I also think, yes, we're going to find out at the very end of episode eight final scene so much like empire strikes back okay ashley what about you I is she a skywalker when will we find out i agree with the final scene but i 100 percent think that she's a skywalker i'm getting in on that bet can i get in on that bet <laughs> wow. i'm betting? taking that money how much are you betting how much are you betting um, 100 bucks uh, oh can i just get it if i win i don't want I don't wanna... <laughs> can i just get it if i win welcome to the world of relationships um, <laughs> But we want to know what you guys think. Hey, jump in the comments section. Let us know. Number one, it's the ongoing debate, but let us know where you're at right now. Is Ray a Skywalker? And number two, do you think we're going to find out in episode eight or episode nine uh, which one she is? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. All right, what's next? According to THR, Universal Pictures is teaming with Peter Jackson on an adaptation of Philip Reeve's science fiction fantasy book series, Mortal Engines. Jackson's wife and partner, Fran Walsh, wrote the script with their collaborator, Philippa Boyens. Jackson will not direct, but will instead hand helming duties over to longtime protege, Christian Rivers, who will make his feature directorial debut. The four-book series is set in a devastated future run on engines where a teen named Ta Natsworthy, along with a young woman from a territory known as the Outlands, uncovers a mystery that could change the world order. A release date has not been set. John, buy or sell a feature film adaptation of Mortal Engines produced by Peter Jackson. You know, I'm going to buy this. Look, when you've had these three people writing scripts together, you usually end up with gold. And they, I, look, would I be more excited about this if they actually said Peter himself was going to direct it? Absolutely, that would be more exciting. But he's got a guy in Rivers that he has been working with for probably over a decade on a lot on all of his major projects he just was a recently the second unit director on the recent pete's dragon and i adored Pre pete's dragon i thought that was really cool so this sounds good to me i'm gonna buy it what about you Schnapp? yeah i'm fully buying it i'm buying it mainly because it's it looks like a really cool uh, steampunk 
kind of uh, yeah. adaptation of one of these uh, series. So I would even shy away from calling it a young adult thing and more like it's a cool science fiction series, something new that Peter Jackson can kind of wrap his head around with a team that he's been working with for like the last like 15, 20 years now. So for me, it's a big buy. I can't wait to see what they come up with. Whether he's directing or not, I think it's because he's producing it, shepherding it, writing it, he can oversee it and he's handing it off to somebody that he trusts. I think it's, it's going to be great. Mark? Uh, I buy the story on its ear before I even knew what the plot was because it's Peter Jackson and a protege of Peter Jackson getting a shot. That worked out very well with District 9. Yes. So maybe you get the same sort of thing here. Whatever Neil Blomkamp has done since then is up for debate, but District 9 was great. Yeah. And it was because Peter Jackson had this company and he thought, you know what? I think that this is the right guy to direct this. So Peter Jackson taps you on the shoulder and says, I think you're right for this project. I'm going to buy it and do it in a big way. I also like the idea of this municipal Darwinism that goes on where towns can be mobilized and there's so few natural resources left on Earth that towns actually have to go siphon ones from other towns mm -hmm. and it becomes an interesting moral conflict there. So, yeah, I'm pretty excited about this. All right, what's next? According to a report from THR, Margot Robbie is in final negotiations to join the cast of Peter Rabbit, Sony's live-action CG hybrid adaptation of the children's tale written by Beatrix Potter. Robbie joins already cast James Corden, Rose Byrne, and Donald Gleason, who will be directed by Will Gluck. The project is described as a modern interpretation of Potter's works, centering on the rivalry between mischievous Peter Rabbit and Mr. McGregor, a man trying to keep a rabbit-free garden. A release date has not been set. Mark Byers saw the adaptation of Margot Robbie and Peter Rabbit. I will buy Margot Robbie being in the new Peter Rabbit. I sell Peter Rabbit getting out of this thing alive. I mean, McGregor is back. He's back with a vengeance. He wants that damn rabbit out of his garden. I think he's going to get the W at the end of the day. But I don't really care about Peter Rabbit. I don't really care about the lore of it. It was never my thing as a little kid. But I do love the cast here, so that's why I'm going to buy it. Schnepp. I'm going to sell it. Um, I'm going to sell it not because Margot Robbie's not talented or the rest of the cast is not talented, but I'm just selling it on the principle of like not honoring voiceover actors. And I'm just kind of, this is live action and CG. I know, but so she's, she playing, could be, she's playing a rabbit. She's they're talking about a, her doing it's voiceover. A, it's a hybrid like my not, Ford Fusion. No, I get it. But they the what I read is she's playing. A, she's another voiceover. Oh, because I thought I read that she was actually going to be a live action actor in it. I could be wrong. I buy it if she's live thing, action. Corden, I sell it if she's a voiceover. Yeah, Corden is the voice of Peter Rabbit, which makes a lot of sense to me. I like that dude a lot. I think right. he'll knock it out with Parker's Rabbit. Gleason is going to be McGregor, so he'll probably be live action. We don't know a lot about Margot Robbie's character other than the fact that she will be voicing a rabbit. But maybe there's like an enchanted <laughs> thing where it's like you're in the animated world and you come into real life. I'm not sure, I'm but it seems saying, like, like she's just going to be doing voiceover. It just, I get it. It's all marketing now. It started with Shrek where it's just actors, actors, actors. So I just feel bad for the voiceover community coming from animation and knowing all of the talent that we have, thousands and thousands of actors who are never getting a chance to play a character in a movie because they're selling it to the parents. I, I get it. That's how it works. That's why you have, you know, actors who've never done voiceover before getting lead roles because they're a name that the parents would be like, oh, these people are in it. It doesn't matter if they know how to play a rabbit or a tortoise or a slug or anything. So to me, it's a, it just, it kind of really bugs me on a deep level. Cause it's like, I know all these actors who are out of work, who are incredible, <laughs> incredible voiceover talents that should be getting these roles and then pepper it in with one or two lead. But every single, every single one of these movies, there was like nine actors most of them have never done voiceover before, but they're names. So of course they're like, hey, we want to attract the parents who have the money or bringing those kids to see the films. I don't know, I guess, you know, I'm just sour about it. Tonight. I think there's going to be a lot of opportunity for unknown voice actors in this movie because do you know how fast rabbits multiply? They're <laughs> constantly having sex and making new little rabbits. So there's going to be a lot of voice opportunities for people we haven't heard of. Look, I buy the story because I am looking forward to this movie a lot. I think this is going to be a really special little film. So, And I am excited about it. This whole thing about getting lead actor, getting like uh, big live action actors to do voicing. Never so done voice yeah, over It's something I've been talking about for years. I mean, when you look back out there, you could probably count on, on just two hands the number of like really where you got a big famous actor to do it where it really, really hit home because that actor did it. Whether you're looking at the aforementioned Tom Hanks as Woody, right. uh, Mike Myers as Shrek, uh, John C. Riley as Wreck-It Ralph. I'll totally. throw that one in there too. But you know, when you go, go to Finding Dory, like 
it didn't matter. Like every character in that movie was voiced by somebody famous and it didn't matter. Like I love, I can't remember the actor's name, but I love the dude from Modern Family. But did he have to be the one voice in there? Did that make it better? No, it didn't make it better. Why not get voice actors who actually train to bring that life to an animated character? And that's what they're specifically trained to do. Um, I, I might get throwing in a name here and there, but I don't know why everybody has to be. But overall, I'm looking forward to this movie. So for me, it's a buy. But I look, I think, I hope I'm not the only person looking forward to this. Wendy, are you looking forward to Peter Rabbit? I think it's going to be really, really cute. I mean, the story is adorable. But to Schnepp's point about Margot Robbie being cast, she doesn't have, I have to agree with him there, she doesn't really have a lot of experience. I think she's done like one animated voiceover before this one. I would have liked to see them cast somebody who has a little bit more experience, may it be um, an actual voiceover actor or someone like Kristen Bell, who has, I think, a little bit more experience. You know, she just came off Frozen and she's done a ton of other She's uh, done a bunch of animated stuff, yeah. yeah. All right, what's next? Disney has released a new clip from Moana featuring Dwayne The Rock Johnson's Maui character singing an original song written by Hamilton's Lin-Manuel Miranda called You're Welcome, who also composed all the original songs for the Pacific Island set musical. The movie originated with a script by Thor Ragnarok filmmaker Taika Waititi and takes place on a mystic island in Polynesia where a young princess named Moana sets sail in search of a fabled island with demigod Maui along for the ride. It opens in theaters on November 23rd. Schnepp, buy or sell the new clip of The Rock singing for Moana. Now, I don't want to be like, you know, some kind of hypocrite. <laughs> <laughs> But this is The Rock, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> and, you know, seeing a clip, like if I saw a clip of Margot Robbie as some <laughs> stupid rabbit hopping around singing a song, maybe I would have so I would have bought that last one. But this one I'm buying because of the clip. When I first heard The Rock was playing this animated character, I was like, all right, The Rock is in everything. He's in every, like three, every week we were announcing another Rock movie. He's, like, he's Shazam, he's Black Adam, he's this, he's now, he's in Mona. I mean, like how other, how, does, does, are there five Rocks? I don't know how many, how he can keep doing all these roles. This is fantastic. It's, it's once again, incredibly animated. The little tattoos coming to life in 2D is just showing what he's singing about. His voice, stupid, goofy, the movements of this character, everything about it, like just this one scene has sold me on the movie. So sometimes getting a, an incredible star really does work. All you <laughs> voiceover actors that I was supporting earlier. <laughs> Mark, what do you think? It's a big buy for me because like a lot of other people, they will be buying tickets to this movie solely based on the fact that The Rock is doing a voice here. And if you hear that The Rock is going to be singing a couple tunes, that's just going to get people's interest, if nothing else. And I didn't like what he was doing with this. There, there's just a little tinge of one of his favorite musical artists of all time, Elvis. You can just see there's a little bit of that performer mm. that wants to come out in there. It's a cool way to do it. I am going to buy it. I mean, look, if, if I was just listening to the radio and that song came on, it's terrible. <laughs> I mean, like out of context, I mean, it's just, I mean, it's, it's the rock who's not a natural born singer. But when you see it in context and you watch the clip, is he singing terribly? Yeah, but you, it's, it's all going towards the character. It's going towards the spirit of the scene and that hokiness and that, that you know, he's kind of this big goofballism about it. That's the character and that's The Rock. And you know, Rock brings so much. The, one of the really cool things about Dwayne Johnson is that unlike a lot of actors in this town, whenever he's in a movie, whether you got him in for a steal or you paid him a fortune, whether he went in because he lost a bet or not, he will break his back to promote that movie and pour every ounce of himself into that movie that he possibly can. And he's kind of fearless that way. And the fact that a guy who can't naturally sing all that great, um, to just put himself out there and in a movie that millions of people are gonna see, I'm gonna belt it out and sing it anyway. And you're right, the style of the tattoos dancing around, I, I loved it. So yeah, I am gonna jump on that train. I'm gonna say for me, it's a buy. All right, guys, listen, we do this show live. And so doing it live, we like to save a little bit of time at the end of each episode for your live Twitter questions. Just jump on Twitter, make sure you're following us at Collider Video and tweet on your questions. Wendy will pick a few questions out that we'll have at the end of the show. I also want to remind you that this is not the only show on Collider Video today. A little bit later, at 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, the new episode of Nightmares drops. So make sure you guys check that out then also. A tag team movie trivia title match is coming at 2 p.m. today. 
with the reigning, defending, and undisputed tag team champions of the world, half of which is Mark Ellis. Mark, you're looking forward to this match today. Oh, John, I've been on the victory train for a while. I have been downright <laughs> spoiled with riches at this very desk, crushing <laughs> fools left and right on the movie trivia showdown. And now we get to bring it back to the tag team belt. Christian and I defending our belts as we will do time and time again Team top 10, they're, they're, they're adorable. They're just the latest chumps to come up, try to poke the bear, and get eaten. And also, guys, don't forget, just keep your eye on Collider Video's feed all day long because we have breaking news that drops, and we do breaking news segments throughout the day. Make sure you keep your eyes open for that. All right, guys, it's time for Mailbag. Listen, we love it when you guys email us, and you can email us anytime at collidervideo at gmail.com. Sorry, not at Collider, just... ClyderVideo at gmail.com. <laughs> Email us anytime. Send it on in. And you maybe you'll see your question pop up right here on Movie Talk. Maybe on our weekend mailbag shows that airs Saturdays and Sundays. So, Ashley, what's in the mailbag? Robert Armstrong writes, Hey, Collider, I was wondering what you knew about Martin Scorsese's movie Silent. From what I could tell, it is supposed to be released around Christmas, probably to get in on some Oscar business, and then go wide release later in January. Yet I haven't seen any trailers or marketing for it like we are starting to see for other movies that are doing the same thing, like Fences or Monster Calls. I'm really excited to see this movie, having read and loved the book, and I'm hoping it won't be too long till we see it. Have you heard or seen anything from this movie, and are you looking forward to it as much as I am? Thanks. Um, the only thing I have heard from it is that it's unfreaking believable. I've heard that from a couple people who watched it on the circuit, Ooh. on the circuit tour. This very well, having been quiet for a little while with all the Spider-Man stuff, this year, it, it, there's a very real possibility here that Andrew Garfield could be starring in two Best Picture nominees mm -hmm. uh, in nominated films. I mean, with Hacksaw Ridge, which is a strong contender, and I've heard that this one is just insane lights out good. But Scorsese, what were we expecting? I've heard that Liam Neeson is probably going to get serious push for an Oscar for probably for Best Supporting Actor for this thing as well. Um, that's what I'm hearing. The fact that they haven't started a big marketing push yet, not unexpected. It's still, you know, in the age of blockbusters, this is still a relatively small film. It's October still. Probably about two months till this movie comes out, a little less than two months. I would expect to see some marketing push for it, maybe in the next two to three weeks, but I don't think it's terribly unusual for a movie with this type of scope to not have started a big push yet at this point. Not to mention, they're saving a lot of that marketing push for when they can include the Oscar buzz with it as well. So you watch, they've got a plan for this. Anyway, Mark, what have you heard? That's a great point, is that maybe they want to see, they want to have it be at more press screenings and critic screenings so that they can get that word of mouth going yeah, once yeah. they show the first trailer of it. I would expect to have seen it by now, though, simply based on the star power, both in front of and behind the camera, with Adam Driver, Andrew Garfield and Liam Neeson starring in the movie Scorsese, an all-time great directing it. The last I heard is, because I don't have the same friends you do, and most of my friends are at Buffalo Wild Wings right now, <laughs> is that it was, that Martin Scorsese was trimming it, and that the running time had clocked in at just under three hours, which is pretty good mm -hmm. for Martin. Because I heard there was a cut that was like four and a half hours oh, at one yeah, point. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's probably why we haven't seen a trailer yet, is that right. they're just trimming the movie, and they don't want to be one of those people we always complain about, where there's so much stuff that's in the trailer that's not in the actual movie, but the premise of this thing alone sounds like Oscar bait that talent involved makes me think it's going to be a great film yeah i the, I, I don't know who you guys are hanging out with because i heard totally i heard they had locked the picture down at like under two and a half Ooh. so or oh, they might have been done the process at okay this point. Yeah. yeah so um and yeah oscar buzz i think they're going to roll it out the same way they rolled out american sniper where it's i think it get drops uh, on december 25th or something yeah like that. in limited markets yeah. and wide and, and then they just once everybody's like it's gonna win an oscar then they'll tag all that stuff all the little leaves and everything will be all around the you know frame of the film nominated for this you know bob skimby's award and you know the oscar and oscar <laughs> and you know best bobbity bobbity with all the leaves and stuff so you know i can't wait to see it so i mean this is another one of those scorsese passion projects and, and american sniper did a great thing with their first trailer i think their trailer had already been re released yes. by this time but american sniper just had that really intense like minute long scene of bradley cooper having to make a very tough decision right. and it just was like what's going to happen we need to see this movie all right That's what's right. next Mark Smith writes, I have a bunch of movie theaters available to me of varying quality and venues. However, I have found myself gravitating to one specific theater to watch all of my must-see movies. The problem is that while the movie theater is by far the most comfortable and the only theater around me that allows seat selection, the screen and audio quality are not as good as others in my area. Am I missing out? So I guess my question is twofold. First, do you have a single movie theater you use to see the more important movie viewings? 
Yes, we all know of Dennis's affinity for the prime. <laughs> and second, if you had to choose between the two, would you rather have comfort and convenience or quality of audio slash video? Yeah, I, I can't stop singing the praises of the Prime. The Prime, the Prime. If you are lucky enough, and if you don't yet, they'll be rolling out soon. The AMC Prime theaters, the Dol, or sorry, as they call them now, the Dolby Cinemas at AMC Prime mm. are insane. They are super comfortable. The Dolby Atmos sound system, the new Dolby dual laser projection system, with the richest colors and the sharpest images and the deepest blacks you've ever seen. It's quite an experience. But if you're not lucky enough to be right beside an AMC Prime. And you've got to choose between, hey, there's a theater over here with with better picture and better sound. There's a theater over here with, uh, you know, it's easier, more accessible to get in there. And they've got much more comfortable seating, much more legroom, all that kind of stuff. Which one do you go for? As long as, if you're talking about the, the theater with the good picture and the good sound, as long as they don't have crap seats. Right, and the folding chairs. Yeah. yeah, and the theater with the more comfortable seats doesn't have like a crap screen with rips and, and stains on it. I always go for comfort first. To me, if I'm not comfortable watching a movie, um, then it's difficult for me to enjoy my experience watching the movie. Mm -hmm. I mean, ideally you want an AMC Prime situation where you've got the best of both worlds, great comfort, great picture, great sound. But if I had to choose one, I'll generally lean towards me. I like to be comfortable in my theater. What about you, Schnapp? Being a larger person, I also lean towards comfort. Uh, there's certain theaters, I won't call them out, that have like very rigid and smaller seats yeah. where I've got long legs. I, I always feel like incredibly uncomfortable, amazing state-of-the-art screen, amazing <laughs> sound. I'm not comfortable the entire the entire time, most like about an hour in, I'm thinking about when is this over so I can leave because I feel like I'm being tortured. So I would go with comfort <laughs> or third option, drive a little bit longer and get both. If there's some place that's like hour, like I've said before, like sometimes you might have to travel 45 minutes to get to that theater that is, has great seating and great, um, you know, cinema uh, and sound. It's worth the travel, is what I think. Is like, because then you're experiencing the movie the way you should, comfortably, and with the greatest uh, screen and sound presence that you can have. So I would take the extra trip, even if it's an hour of going out of town, make it a journey and bring all your friends. Mark? You know, as a finely tuned athlete, I get this question a lot, <laughs> is where can you rest after a harrowing workout, or where yes. can I prepare for another league basketball championship? And so I will also take comfort, because I, my, my back, I want my back to be comfortable. I sat in a theater, it was a screen room so it wasn't like a movie theater but it was so uncomfortable luckily the quality of the movie was so great that it didn't bug me as much as it would have but I can't stand not being comfortable in a movie so if it's less than dynamite projection or audio I can handle it but you're forgetting the big question here is that I went to a theater it's a smaller theater chain that will children remain nameless Popcorn was way too salty. You can't oversalt your oh, popcorn. Let gotta me, have good popcorn. The consumer be the judge of how salty the popcorn is. I mean, this was literally, it was, I felt like a horse licking a salt lick. Wow. That's Not quite happy. an image. That's salty. Not happy <laughs> that's, about it. that's salty. That's no, really sorry, I didn't like it. All right, let's get to our Twitter questions. Wendy, what have you pulled out? First one comes from Phil Fang Foom. He writes, Do you think showing specific events like the Kessel Run in a Star Wars film <clears throat> ruins the mystique of the lore? There is a danger of that. Like, absolutely, there are some things that just need need to be remain mysterious. Uh, like in Star Trek, I think it was actually a little bit of a mistake for them to actually show the Kobayashi Maru maneuver, right? Mm -hmm. Because that was always just been one of the things that's just kind of a part of the legend of Kirk, the one man who beat the Kobayashi Maru right. exercise, like right? And then they actually showed it. And I understand why they did. And they did a good job with it too, they did. but. It kind of took away that the aura of the legendness of it a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think there's much chance that they don't show the Kessel Run. I'm, I'm pretty sure they're going to do it. I would like that one to just remain a bit of a mystery for me personally. I don't know, Mark. What do you think? You look deep in thought. Like you're I am. conflicted. I can tell. In, in more ways than one, John. Because first of all, I'm trying to think. I know that they really imply in Force Awakens that Han Solo is the guy who made the Kessel Run. But when he introduces that fact in A New Hope, he says that you never heard of the Millennium Falcon. It's the ship that made the Kessel Run. He doesn't necessarily say he's the pilot that, that was flying it. Maybe Lando made the Kessel Run at a pretty impressive time too. I'm trying to think if I'd rather see the Kessel Run happen on screen or the exchange of the Falcon from Lando to Han on the big screen. I think I got to see the Kessel Run. I think that mm. the way that Orton Miller direct the movie, the way that this, the cinematographer they got on there who does big sweeping shots really well, I think I'd like to see the Kessel Run. I think they're going to do it pride. How about I, you, Schnepp? I'm, I'm saying you're going to see both. I think Lando is does the Kessel Run and then Han wins it from him 
in the Kessel Run. That's a, that's a that you get both, and I'd love to see the Kessel Run. Ever since hearing about it, that's one of those things where like, are they ever going to show the Kessel Run? It's like I never thought they would. Now that they're doing Young Han Solo and they've got Lando in there, bet your bottom dollar that's going to be a part of the film. Yeah, not a big thing, will. but I'm sure it will be. Remember those when the, those young kids? They thought that Han made it in 14 parsecs. Or something. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody knows it was those 12. Crazy Dumb kids. kids. Uh, all right, what's next? Uh, all right, DJ Dex says, with the news of Captain Planet, what cartoon from your childhood do you d do you think deserve a film adaptation? We get questions like this every once in a while. Let, let's just be clear. There has been no official word that a Captain Planet movie is happening. It's just that the rights have become available. There's certain production companies, including Leonardo DiCaprio's, that are making bids on them and trying to secure that. And even if they do secure it, that doesn't necessarily mean a movie's going to happen. So just let's be clear on that. Um, a cartoon, I mean... Herculoids. I'll Herculoids was. I want to see the Herculoids. That's a weird one. It's it's got all these giant. Did you ever monsters. see they were they they popped up on Family Guy once? Do you remember no. that? They popped the Herculoids have popped up on Family I love Guy the Herculoids. once. It was really fun because that was the one with the rhinoceros that shoot like Nerf balls out yeah. of its tusks and, and the they, giant they, they, weird metallic like granite ape and then Gloof and Glimp or whatever little like schmoo creatures you know the weird orbs living eggs. Mark, you're looking at me strangely. I just on? never heard of the Herculoids. It sounds like Hercules My has been doing some goodness. PEDs that are not you know strictly enforced in his sport I am going to go with the three cartoons I grew up loving in the Ellis household they were always around Transformers we tried at that G.I. Joe we made some game efforts at that and He-Man Masters <laughs> of the Universe my favorite show when I was a kid I still don't know that you can bring it to the big screen the right way I know Christian will talk all day about how it can be made right, right. it wasn't the first time I never actually saw the live action it's movie it's classic oh, you gotta see the one Dolph Lundgren, Lundgren. So. it's classic and with the little wizard quill door he's like yeah. hmm <laughs> Like a with this magical Yoda? synthesizer yeah. that travels through time I know, and space. I know Courtney Cox is in it. Dolph Lundgren, Franklin, and Jello Skeletor. I can't believe I haven't checked that movie out. But after watching the Star Wars Holiday Special and what that did to me emotionally, <laughs> mentally, physically, I don't want to revisit <laughs> yeah. the lore of He-Man unless it's good. Well, uh, I, I, I cannot believe, actually, that they have not done another He-Man He-Man movie, Masters of the Universe movie, crazy. in the past like ten years. I, it's just it's a property right to be made. But the one that I'm always preaching on, and I know there's an Asian version of it, and I saw it. I'll be honest, I wasn't all that thrilled with it. But I, there keeps being talks about there being a North American version of Space Battleship Yamato, mm. also, also known as Star Blazers. Mm. I used to run home from school so I could watch the the reruns of that. I mean, I loved that show, and the whole idea is about Earth is being poisoned, so and they they find, they get a message from deep space that there's this planet that has a way to fix the Earth of all of its bad radiation because Earthlings are now living underground to escape the radiations, but the radiation is seeping through the Earth, and so they think, well, how are we going to get out there? And for some reason, they come up with the idea, hey, let's re let's up uproot the old World War II battleship Yamato. And we'll retrofit it into a space cruiser, nice. a space battleship Yamato, and so where it comes from. And then they got to fly through all these hostile aliens to get to the good planet and pick up the machine that's going to fix the world. I'm very excited. You just got me super sweaty about Battle of the Planets, yo. Yeah, G Force. G -Force. I know you know all the names. Oh, You're like, okay, Ki uh, okay. Ki so you got Mark, Jason, Tiny, Kiop, uh, wait, Mark, and Princess. Yep. And That's they all form it. together to become this badass, uh, like almost like a phoenix creature. Well, they, right? have, they have their their ship is yeah. the phoenix, yeah. and the, their ship had one big red button that fired their only weapon, little missiles. So you just see there always be a close up of the red button. I would love to see they would just go live action adaptation of that. I mean, it's such a cool animation. I remember as a there's kid. There's a trailer watching online it. for an. Like, I don't know if it was just to be a trailer or if it was actually a movie. But if you look on YouTube, there's an Asian. Like trailer of G Force. Whoa. Yeah, right. you should check it out. Wendy, Watching you got any that. cartoons you'd want to see made? You guys are getting sweaty over there, yeah. huh? Wow. <laughs> I got very, I got very <laughs> excited <laughs> about this. <laughs> um, I would love to see Thundercats and I would love to see Gargoyle. Nice. Speaking of fake trailers, it's like seven or eight years old now. There is a Thundercats trailer on YouTube with Vin Diesel, Brad, Brad Pitt. Pitt. It is it's it's I mean it's look and remember it was made like seven or eight years right. ago so maybe that same guy could make them look better now but it looked pretty convincing <laughs> check out check out I'm the, watching that. that as soon as we stop yeah, it was funny 
Wow. All right, guys, that'll do it for this installment of Collider Movie Talk. Thank you so much for joining us today. Listen, don't forget, the most important part of this show is the conversation. What do you have to say about all the topics that we talked about? Jump into the discussion below and leave your thoughts. I want to thank the guys sitting at the table with me. First of all, Mr. John Schnepp. Schnepp, where can people find you? You can find me on Twitter and Instagram, just at John Schnepp. You can find me at Stan Lee's LA Comic Con this coming weekend at booth 326. And then we've got a Collider Heroes panel. There's a Schmoes panel. There's a whole bunch of cool stuff going on. And follow me on uh, Schnepp Zone on YouTube. I'm going to be dropping a horror film. Sitting right next to me, the finely tuned athlete, Mr. Mark Ellis. Mark, where can people find you? You guys can find me taking the G-Force's <laughs> lunch money after this podcast. <laughs> and later today, the team belts are on the line when Christian and I will defend our belts against Team Top 10 and online at Mark Ellis Live on all social media. Yeah, and also don't forget, with the LA Comic Con, we've got a movie trivia showdown panel. I believe that's at 5 o'clock yep, on, on Saturday. Saturday. Our Heroes mm -hmm. panel, I believe, is at 1, 1 o'clock yep. there. But we also have a Collider video meet and greet. Uh, what's the what's the name of the... The Lux. the Lux. At the Lux Hotel, right across the street from the LA Convention Center. We're up at the bar on the second floor. That starts at 7 p.m. on Saturday. Come on down and say hello, unless you're like a weirdo. And the bartenders <laughs> better not be jerks this time. That's all I can say. <laughs> And of course, over at that table, <laughs> Ashley Mova. Where can people find you? Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, Ashley Mova. Happy Tuesday, guys. Our very own Wendy Lee. Where can people find you? You can find me on YouTube at the Movie Couple channel and also on Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat at Wendy Lee Zaney. And you can follow me on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, simply at John Campia. Make sure you subscribe to Comic Con HQ, where John Schnepp and I have our weekly movie magazine show, Film HQ. New episodes drop every Saturday. Make sure, guys, too. Check down on our playlist for our Crash Course videos. I think you're going to find some things there that you like. That'll do it for us, guys. Thanks a lot for joining us. My name is John Campion. Until next time, bye-bye. Hey, guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.